On this episode, putting off a former life and learning to live off the fat of the land, even when the pickings are a little lean. The stakes could not be higher. The pots could not be smaller. The men could not be hungrier. I see something. Yeah, we got a crab. Oh, he's a Dungeness. Oh. And later, why did this man trade a career in tech for life down on the farm? Because he wants to make the other white meat red. Pigs were never meant to be a white meat. But it might take a bit of diplomacy. So the Chinese and the Russian pigs have been brought together to create what used to be a German pig. So they're all communists. Exactly. <laughs> Very early, somewhat foggy. Uh, we're headed up to Bodega Bay, up from San Francisco through Petaluma, ultimately to Point Reyes, to uh, meet a guy named Hank Shaw. Hank is a forager, <laughs> which I believe used to mean scavenger, but now refers to people who find all the food that they need to survive uh, with their own two hands. So we're gonna spend the day, two people, out in the foggy world of Northern California, living off the fat of the land, just like George and Lenny from Steinbeck's Mice and Men. Jones, you familiar with that little yes, piece that of work? One I got. got it? Mm -hmm. All right. Didn't work out for them. There are lots of great restaurants in Bodega Bay, California. I won't be visiting any of them today. Instead, I'll be dining al fresco and finding my food the old-fashioned way. In other words, rooting around for it. Our somebody is a guy called Hank Shaw, and he's what you call a professional forager, and he knows all the best places to eat. Good. Hey. Hey. How are you? Nice to meet you. Likewise. <laughs> Where have you brought us exactly? Well, this is uh, Spud Point Marina in Bodega Bay. Spud Point. Yeah. There's our pet sea lion. That's the management. Yeah. He loves crab traps, which is not good for us, but. <laughs> <laughs> he's totally giving me the stink eye. Oh, yeah. Well, he's, he's waiting for you to throw something in the water. <laughs> Troy, get in the water. <laughs> <laughs> the ultimate sacrifice. OK, many questions. Uh, you're, a, you're a forager? Mm-hmm. Is a, like a professional forager? Well, I mean, I do forage occasionally for restaurants, but only to one of my friends are the chefs. That's not really how I make my living. Okay. Um, I'm, I mostly write, uh, I've got a website. Mm -hmm. Mostly I write about wild stuff. So if you, if you can't buy it, you know, whether it's foraged or fished or, uh, or, or hunted, that's kind of what I write about. What are we fishing for? Yak smelt. Okay. I, I was throwing a crab trap here, but uh, the management said But the showed management up. said no. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see once again how management can thwart productivity. So I've actually light baited this. I, this is wild boar liver soaked in fish sauce. And it's it's what I had. You want something sneaky and oily. Do you have the rest of the wild boar? Uh, actually, you're gonna get some of it as salami later. <laughs> All right, well, let's see if we can get so it past management. This is a, this is a hoop net. Mm -hmm. I don't, have you ever thrown a hoop net? Yeah, I have. Yeah. It's a, not on like a, yeah, just exactly. chuck it like a Frisbee, right? Maybe over in this area. There you go, perfect. Are these guys endangered? You don't, you don't forage these. No, no, no. You can't even harass marine mammals, uh, let alone hunt them. What do you mean harass? Oh, so like if we were to throw rocks at him or something like that, that's actually a crime. Where's the line with harassment? Uh, I mean, depends. rocks I get. You throw Dep a rock at a thing, it's a... It's a I mean, you uh, could uh, say disparaging things to him. That's what I said. Like, <laughs> like, like, like right now we're talking about him, he could file a complaint. Fur bag! No, <sighs> no go. Well, we've been foraging for uh, the better part of an hour. We've got some uh, <laughs> liver from a boar, but I'm optimistic. The whole day is before us. Oh yeah. And we're looking. We're gonna go look for mushrooms. We're gonna try and catch some crabs right now. All right, crabs. We're gonna go to the spot where I've, I've caught them before. Let me translate. We're going to the spot where the crabs are. Yeah. Not for you. <laughs> Hope is that thing with feathers. Emily Dickinson. Steady unsafe. Once again, a little man in peril. I love to stop and check in with the men in peril. <laughs> that guy's in peril of a giant wave. He's in peril of just falling. A thousand I, Ways to Die out on the bay. I love that show. So I'm here at Bodega Bay with a forager named Hank Shaw. We're headed toward a good spot for crabbing and away from the watchful eye of the management. This is the Mike Rowe crab pot. Oh really? Yes. Well then you ought to teach me how to rig it. Sure. 
It's the daintiest crab pot I've ever seen. I know. It's just like the deadliest catch. It's daintiest catch. It's the <laughs> <laughs> August, <laughs> Bodega Bay. The stakes could not be higher. The pots could not be smaller. <laughs> the men could not be hungrier. We're foraging for our food, and anything could happen. Da -da -da. Cue, yeah, we cue can scary make it music. exciting. We can make it exciting. <laughs> So are you a hunter who gathers or a gatherer who hunts? A gatherer who hunts. Ah. If I had a boat, I would have taken you salmon fishing. Why don't you have a boat? Because I'm not in that tax bracket. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how experienced a breakwater climber you are, but it's always good to have sort of the, the tripods, sort of yep. the feet and in one Three hand. Three points of contact. Yep. Ideally, one of them not being your face. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's some good crabs right there. Yeah, they're right there. Yeah. Sometimes you can spend all day and you get nothing. Sometimes you can spend all day and it's a bonanza. And, but usually what happens is you'll sit there and you're like, this sucks, right? And then at some point the tide will change or the temperature of the water will change. And all of a sudden, bam! You're and then you completely forget about the previous four hours. The best trout you've ever eaten is that one you just pulled out of the water. Yeah. And it's because you worked for it. Or you waited for it. Yeah, or you waited for it. You gonna check that now? Yeah. I see something. Yeah, we got a crab. Oh, he's a Dungeness. <laughs> Strike two. Yep. Oh. He's actually the perfect catch, except for the fact that he's too small and out of season. <laughs> but aside from that, we're killing it. <laughs> Foraging isn't easy. If it was, I guess everybody would be doing it. All I know for sure is it's afternoon, and I have officially missed two meals. There's a red crab. Hey. Yeah, there's a crab. Hey, it's a red crab. <laughs> he ain't gonna be big enough. At least we have seen the correct species. We now know that red crabs exist, at least. <laughs> so far, we're 0 for 2. No fish and no crabs. But Hank assures me there are plants to eat somewhere. Do you know, the Indians who used to live here, they would use up to 160 different plants as food plants. Could you imagine the average Joe? They probably eat 12. The short answer is no. I had no idea the Indians that used to live along the northern coast of California ate 160 different kinds of plants. All I know is I'm ready to eat all of them. So far, the pickings have been slim, but Hank's optimism is unflappable. So let me show you that plant I was telling you about. This is New Zealand spinach. I see. Do you want some to take? I we do, yeah. We're gonna actually eat this. Yeah? We're gonna eat the leaves. So if you just kind of pinch off above a leaf, or we can use a knife, either way. I like the idea of pinching one off. <laughs> and so we'll take a few of these. Sure. You only see New Zealand spinach by the dunes on the west coast. Mm -hmm. Well, since we didn't get any crabs, we will stop on the way over to Point Reyes for some alternate protein. We got a cool little throwback little place. Do you remember the honor boxes? Honor boxes are left over from a kinder, gentler age. Farmers leave fresh eggs in them, you leave some money, and you take some eggs. It's nice to be in a part of the world where the honor system is still honored. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's great, you're driving right down the road and you need some eggs. <laughs> On to Point Reyes. All right. Now that we've secured some protein and our sides, Hank has promised me something special for dessert. But, as with any great dessert spot, this one is a little bit out of the way. But, unlike your trendy neighborhood cronut shop, when we finally get to the berries, we won't have to stand in line. So, what you have here is kind of a row upon row of evergreen huckleberries. They're, uh, they're a western cousin of the blueberry. You see, this is it. Basically, when I pick, I, I walk around, and I walk around until I find bushes that are, are, are loaded enough like this. Right. I call that a stand and pick. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I'm picking one berry here and one berry there. And you, you can actually do some damage yeah, one spot absolutely. here. Absolutely. Just pick away and just, when your hand fills up, put them in the uh, little bin mm -hmm. and move on. The huckleberry. This looks very uh, primeval. Doesn't it? I think we're good. I think we got enough to make dessert with. I'm hungry, I don't know about you. I could eat. 
I, I don't know what we're gonna eat. We got huckleberry, we got eggs. I brought some stuff from home. I was making sure you wouldn't get hungry. <laughs> Good news. Of course, even a hardcore forager like Hank knows you still have to pack your own condiments and tableware. So the reality then is, it's not like every single day you start off with an empty pantry and you exactly. have to go and eat what you kill. You catch as catch can, and then you preserve the harvest. You talk about foraging, and you talk about people who go out and they hunt and they gather, and you know, it's always about what did they find. But it seems like you are as interested in whether it tastes good. Oh yeah. But see, that to me, that's what, that's what makes you extra freaky and interesting. <laughs> Let's add a little wild onion powder. Some salmon? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. New Zealand spinach. That's really great. Isn't that cool? What do you do with it? Well, you know, I've never actually eaten these little seed pod things. Oh. Well, it's a big day for all of us. And I don't like them. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Just mix everything together. Mm-hmm. Oh, perfect. I'm not really necessarily asking people to do what I do. What I really hope people do is take a piece of what I do, whether it's hunting, whether it's fishing, whether it's forging berries or picking clams in the seashore. Something about it will float your boat. Cast around until you find it and make it yours and pass it on. Thanks for your hospitality. You're welcome. Your big brain, your <laughs> boundless knowledge. Really good. Well, that was fun, but to be honest, I am not yet full. Yes, I know gluttony is a sin, but I'm pretty sure I haven't overindulged. And I'm hoping, just around the bend of this foggy road in Northern California, I'll be magically transported to a farm in Iowa, where someone will feed me a pig. Well, that was easy. We're on our way to meet Carl Edgar Blake. Carl fell in love with computers back in middle school. After that, he found a career building internet portals and computer networks. So why is he holding a pig? Because when you cross a computer geek with an Iowa farm boy, you wind up with a man on a mission, a big mission. Sum it up for me, what is the mission in, in Carl's own words? Uh, the mission is to try to swap out existing pork and create a heritage style pig that can replace that and give us better pork to eat and bring some of our farmers back. You bred a pig with a basset hound. Join us, won't you? It's the ugliest pig ever made. <laughs> This is the most extraordinary pig I've ever seen. <laughs> Carl is preoccupied with the pursuit of superior pork, and his approach is both futuristic and historic. I wanted to create a pig like they had in 1821 Germany, and I knew that the pig was made in 1821 by using the Chinese pig, Mimishan, with the Russian wild boar of the time in Germany. So I figured, why not try to recreate that pig here in the United States? and the resulting pig we called the Iowa Swabian Hole. Carl didn't choose this ugly Chinese pig just because he felt sorry for it. Turns out the Mishan have some very unique qualities. The Chinese have been breeding this pig for thousands of years, and there's so many properties that this pig has that it's important to what we're doing in the pork industry, but they have more fat on them than any other pig in the world. They have 82% fat and 18% meat. There's hardly any meat on these pigs at all. These pigs are useless to go and take them and slaughter. So the Chinese and the Russian pigs have been brought together to create what used to be a German pig. So they're all communists. Exactly. <laughs> it's like the UN, man. <laughs> See how the back is not big muscled out like a regular ham? What we wanted was the fat. The fat is where it's at. The fat gives it succulence. And then the meat is a dark red meat rather than a white meat, because pigs were never meant to be a white meat. Mm -hmm. And the Michon pig is like a big giant St. Bernard, but they're not like a Russian, which will go through a six by six hole and try to kill you and eat you. That's why I wear one strap bibs, is because I had to get out of a pen with a, with a Russian boar in it once, and, and the strap went over my shoulder, and I couldn't climb out because my arm was stuck. Is that the meanest pig? With the Russian wild boar, yeah, that's very violent. But when you breed the two together, you end up with a pig that's right in the middle. Well, these pigs are nice enough that you can walk in there and if you scratch their belly enough, they will fall on the ground and let you scratch them, and they'll just lay there. You're saying I can go in there and scratch a, be a pig belly, and it'll just roll right down? Yep, fall down. Really? All right, I'm going to go in there. Show me your technique. Just scratch it right on 
her stomach, and usually she'll fall. We'll get her on both her. sides and see what happens. I have done a lot of things to pigs over the years. Never did this. The pig market now has gone way too far. They made the pigs no, no fat. They've made them a white meat. They made them all these things that they shouldn't be. They need to come back, to swing the pendulum back. Well, that's, that's borderline that's controversial right there. Right? I mean, you're saying that the other white meat thing uh, is not necessarily... I'll give you $1,000 for the first pig with white meat that can be in any taste contest you have with my worst pig on the block. Hey, meanwhile, Cole has had some success over here, it looks you like. Bet. Cole, you did it. Wow. Put him right to what? Which one is that? We haven't named this pig yet. You haven't named it? Oh, we ought to name that pig. Let's call it uh, dinner. <laughs> I call him all bacon. <laughs> Carl has single handedly created a better tasting heritage pig. And just like in the tech industry, that kind of innovation is universally accepted and welcomed, right? You're trying to bring a breed of pig that's globally famous into this country, and the government is upset with you. Your own industry seems to be pushing back. Because the entire pork industry is owned by like six entities, and they don't own these pigs or the genetics. Do you have any idea how many people you're going to piss off with this kind of talk? I don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you, man. Good for you. Maybe we can continue this conversation over a pork chop. Let's do it. I gotta be honest, man. It's delicious. That's what we're shooting for. It's so odd to see a little bit of red in it, but that's... That's what we want. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. You gonna go out? Yeah. Both of our somebodies have left their old lives behind in order to blaze their own paths toward how each believed their life was originally intended to be. Carl is challenging the idea that pork is the other white meat, while Hank is living off the fat of the land when the land cooperates. Either way, I'm not going home hungry. <laughs>